Okay, sorry for the delay, but uh, let's start with uh, looking at some interesting facts of this book. Uh, uh, an introduction is always helpful for an anyone before you jump into the book. So, the book of Job is part of this uh, wisdom literature. Pardon me if I cannot turn my neck. <coughs> And wisdom literature would include a uh, book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and so on. And wisdom literature, actually, they offer insights into daily living, right? They offer uh, the, the different perspective of uh, one's uh, troubles, uh, and questions about God as you go through life. Because as you go through life, there are moments of uh, joy and depression and when you are stressed, when you are being pursued by enemies and, and so on and so forth. So when you face such challenges, this is where you turn to Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and so on. And then you, you, you get uh, you know, assurance, you get comfort and so on. And wisdom literature, if you go and study, they are divided mainly into two categories. One is optimistic wisdom, and one is pessimistic wisdom. Example, in the book of Proverbs, you will find a lot of optimistic uh, wisdom, telling you about, you know, wisdom of life, and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it's pessimistic. Yeah? Everything is futility, chasing after the wind and so on. And this Ecclesiastes was written when Song of Solomon was written when Solomon was young, right? Chasing after women, young, vibrant and so on. So wow, his love story and so on. Book of Proverbs was written. Uh, when he was like at the peak of his life. So he has all the wisdom and so on in the whole world. Even the queen from uh, Ethiopia came, Queen Shiva, to listen to him. Then when you look at Ecclesiastes, it was written when Solomon was old and grey. He got back ache and neck ache. You know? <laughs> and that's when he reflected on life and said, it's been a waste of time now, you know, chasing after all this. Everything is meaningless. So a bit pessimistic, but we can learn from his experience. So, second point. It is one of the oldest books uh, that has been discovered, and also from in the Bible. And it is said to come from uh, the era of Abraham, the patriarch. How so? Because if you study this book of Job, you will find that there is no mention of the law, the covenant, yeah, uh, nothing mentioned of Moses or any reference to that period of the law. So if it is not that period, because from Moses onwards, the law and so on, and you find that all the literature when they when it's recorded and, and, and for us as we study, they all point somehow to the law, to God, to the covenant, to obedience, to the commandments, to the statutes and so on. All the way until the 400 silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament and then Jesus came, grace. But all this were, were not mentioned so, the only inference or conclusion is it must be before. In fact, it must be before. And I'll show you some references, some arguments why uh, it is from the era of Abraham. They still do not know who is the author. Some say Job himself, some don't. But anyway, the author is the Holy Spirit. We do not know exactly who is the author. So, copy finish. If not, it will be emailed to you. Arguments for Abraham's era. How so? If we look at Job 42, the last chapter of Job, 
verse 16 and 17. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Now, this only occurred during the time of, you know, Genesis. If you remember, day one, day two, day three, and then after that, Adam and Eve, then all the Sula, Methuselah, and all the, they all lived long, 800 over years, 900 over years, and so on. But subsequently, you see, Job must be quite old, because after this, he, he has gone through uh, a, a period where he was with family, 10 kids, and 10 kids, uh, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, like sound of music. Uh. And when the 10 kids were taken away, they were adults, they were not kids. So Job himself must be quite senior. Then after the suffering and so on, then God gave him back another one, 10 children plus all the other assets. So by now he should be quite old, right? But he lived for another 140 years and, and, and saw four more generations. So he must be pretty old when he passed on. So it cannot be, it cannot be from the generation, from the period of the law. And if you, you look at Moses, he also didn't live very long. I mean, 100 over years are quite long. Compared to, but compared to his forefathers, not that long. So that is one evidence of uh, him coming from that generation of Genesis. And then, you see in Job chapter 1 verse 5. Job chapter 1 verse 5. And this I have mentioned uh, as an item when I spoke at prayer meeting some years back. We, we ought to emulate Job, a God-fearing father and a God-fearing husband. God-fearing father because every, every time, every morning, he will come and offer burnt offerings for his children for fear that his kids are in their during their celebrations, their parties and so on, they may have uh, cursed God or blessed him in a very evil sense. That this Job wanted to stand in the gap and he did make burnt offerings. And that means he acted as the priest of his family. The role of a priest. Now, if you know, and, and you know the, the, the law by now, right? Only those from the Levites are, are priests. Am I right? And they minister in the early days in the tabernacle, in the later days in the temple. So it's not like anyone can just be a priest in his own household. Are you from the tribe of Levi? No, so you can't. But this job was doing and performing the role of a priest in his family. So it is thus that he had no knowledge of the law. There was no law, because if there was law, and he was in the period of the law, he wouldn't have acted as the priest in his family. There was no law. So he played the role of a priest in his family. So it must be before. Because after the law, everything points towards that, and then after that, pointed to Jesus into the New Testament. Are you following the argument? Mm. Or you are lost? Who is lost? Who is lost? What, what we are trying to prove is by elimination. Okay, by elimination. The fact that he lived so long, the people in the law period, they don't live so long. But the period during Genesis, Abraham's time, they lived long. So that is one evidence. Under the law, from Moses onwards, the role of the priest was clearly assigned and defined. If you are not a Levite, you can't. But here, it didn't say that Job is, was a Levite. In fact, the tribes has not come yet. Okay? So, and he acted as a priest. So it has to be 
before the law. Okay, that's the argument. And then we have got uh, Eliphaz. Eliphaz is one of the three friends, so-called friends. Actually, they are friends, uh, but they didn't exactly help him very much. They came and they offered the uh, human wisdom. So the first of whom is Eliphaz. We'll, I will tell you more about Eliphaz and Bildad and so far as we go along. But Eliphaz, where did he come from? You look at Genesis 36 verse 10. Genesis 36 verse 10. These were the names. This is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. You know Esau, right? Mm -hmm. Jacob and Esau. Mm -hmm. And so this is the lineage uh, of Esau, father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's sons. <coughs> Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. And Reuel, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau, and so on and so forth. Verse 11, and the sons of Eliphaz were Timan, Timan, T-E-M-A-N, Omar, Zepho, Zekatam, Kenes, and so on. And when you read, when you read chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, Job, chapter 4, verse 1, Job, chapter 4, verse, verse 1, then Eliphaz, the Timonite, answered. Then Eliphaz, the Timonite, answered. You see the link? So, this is another evidence that Eliphaz descended from Esau's eldest son, which we just read, the family tree, right? So, if Eliphaz was a descendant of Esau's eldest son, that means he came from that period. And because he came from that period, when his friend Job was down with boils all over his body, he went to comfort his friend Job. You understand? Okay. And so, this couple, these few arguments, uh, sort of uh, convince the scholars and commentators and so on that this is indeed one of the oldest books and they and it came from the era of Abraham and we see the suffering of Job so sometimes when people go through difficulties and challenges and so on we, we sort of describe the person as you know you are going through the suffering of Job but do not be described as Job's comforters if you if someone calls you a Job comforter you know what it means uh? You are a miserable comforter. Yeah. You are sincere, but you are sincerely wrong. You are of no help to me. Understand? Okay? So, next, we do not know the name of the author. But from the study of the 42 chapters, this guy, quite intelligent, quite smart. As we shall see, he was a wide travel uh, person. He, he must have gone to many places to have seen many things because in the things that he brought up and described and, and he did comparison, he brought up analogy and so on. This must be one person who has seen the world. If all you ever did was to stay in Kaki Bukit, that is your world, you understand? But if you go Jurong, you go Tuas, you go Pongol and so on, well, you see a bit more. Yeah, you cross the, the sea, you go Malaysia, you see a bit more. Then you go Batam, Bintang and so on. But when you go to the Arctic, Antarctic and so on, yeah, like some air stuff, right? You see a lot more. So this guy, he must have traveled quite a bit. And he has lots of knowledge and experience. And if... Uh, you turn like, when we were when we get to chapters 9, 38, and so on. Hey, this guy knows about constellations, uh, stars, uh, 
I mean, we all see stars, uh, but in, in a very uh, painful situation, we get knocked and uh, see stars. But this guy could describe the constellations. He could discuss uh, meteorology, you know, it's that atmosphere, weather, and so on. Yeah, I study a lot, no? I study uh, up to JC and then I went to university and so on. I, I don't know as much as him. This guy from the era of Abraham. Uh, Wow, that guy TC, no, touch it. We all compared to him like BTC, okay? <clears throat> and he could describe a very sophisticated mining operation because they mine for gold, they mine for precious metals and so on. Can you know? Can you describe how they do it? We don't know. We only know how to appreciate gold, yeah, mm -hmm. and pay for the gold. But this person could describe the operation. And then he can go from there to see about boats, about sheep plying the waters. He could talk, talk about plants, papyrus, which was used, you know, uh, as, as a form of writing material, reeds and so on, that grew in the marshes. So he has been to Africa. Uh, there are marshes in the Middle East. And then he also must have watched National Geographic. Wow, he knows about ostriches, eagles, mountain goats, hippopotamus, crocodiles, and war horses. And all this can be found in the last few chapters, chapters 39 to 41. He could describe all this. Which, if your world is so small and narrow, your, your perspective can be limited, your, your experience and your knowledge. So, if you are not going to travel the world, if you're not going to the sea, or going down to the mine, or going up to the sky, can you read the Bible? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I tell you, I personally know some people, they, they, they get wiser and wiser and they speak so well. And then you thought they have been to different places and so on, they have gone to theological studies and an MBA, you know, M, M, MB, don't know what. But actually, they learn all this from the Bible. So read the Bible. Study the Bible. In here is the wisdom of God that you can learn. Okay, so this is about the author. Next. You don't finish. Okay. Next, then we have a question now. Scholars also got this question. Is it fact or is it fiction? This book, is it facts? It, it, was there really a man by the name of Job? Was there? Or was it fiction? Just uh, somebody writing a story just to tell us about the, the problem of suffering, you know, and, and going through the pains of misery and so on. Was it? Uh, or was it uh, as... This is from David Pawson. He put it together. He called it faction. Faction. Okay, come, let's move on. Okay, copy it. Okay. So, Job. Was Job a fact? Was he a historical person? We look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Verse 14. <clears throat> Ezekiel 14, verse 14. And you see that he was quoted by the prophet Ezekiel. And in verse 14, he wrote, Even if these three men, men means written the real one, okay? Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Because this whole chapter 14 is about Jerusalem's iniquity. That means their sinful state. And God was saying that, Jerusalem, you are terrible. If at all, only these righteous people, who are they? Noah, Daniel, and Job, they will be delivered. The rest of you, you are failed the test, you understand? So Job was highlighted as a person. 
Verse 20 again, same chapter, Ezekiel. Even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. <coughs> you understand this? It is still the same today. God doesn't have grandchildren. Noah, Daniel, and Job could only deliver themselves by their own righteousness. But today, today, it is not by our own righteousness. It is by the righteousness of Jesus imputed upon us. And on that basis, we have been redeemed. But it does not mean my son, my daughter, and everyone else in my household shall be. Because they, each and every one of them, would have to come to Jesus personally. You understand? Mm -hmm. It is also in the Old Testament. They would only deliver themselves by their righteousness. Neither son, their son nor daughter. Okay? And then in James chapter 5, the book of James is a very practical book. And so, our friend James is not one who is very speculative, a dreamer. You know, some people like to dream, right? They are so spiritual. And as my, my, my dear teacher, John Gallop said, you are so spiritual on that you are of no earthly use. <laughs> because you're always floating around. Nothing realistic, nothing practical. So, anyway, James chapter 5, verse 11. What did James say? Indeed, we count... Is Job the higher? Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful because at the end, his ending, his finishing was better than the beginning. And it's all because of the compassion of God and the mercy of God. Have you heard the perseverance of Job? And James would not be one who would just pull a name out because he's a practical man. And so he made reference to Job. Brought him up as an illustration to encourage the people. Persevere! Persevere! Because at the end, God who is compassionate and mercy will see you through. Okay? So, in black, this one in black, huh? fact. Okay, now we go on to fiction. Is it fiction? Some people think so. You know why? Because as we shall start reading shortly, you will know that the way it is written, like when Job's uh, children were taken away, suddenly calamity struck. And then one servant will run to Job uh, and say, Hey, your kids, uh, your son, all die. Uh, servants all die. But I was the only one who survived to come and tell you, right? And then, next moment, another servant came along. Hey, another calamity struck. Your, 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 your child died. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, your, your children died. And then, uh, all possessions lost. But I'm the only one. And then the third one, and the fourth one. So he had four reportings, all the same. And it looks like, it cannot be at least too good to be true. You understand? It's all written like fiction or like story. Uh, so, Episode 1, then repeat. Episode 2, repeat. Episode 3, all same, same. In, in life, is it really that, you know, precise, you know, that it goes in that sequence? And then, the, the thing is, happy ending. Like Anna Blyton, huh? and they live happily ever after. Wow, good story. We love all these kind of stories, right? If I leave the cinema crying, I have a lousy show. <laughs> lousy show. They live happily ever after. And it's an ending was quite good. So, too good to be true. How can be, in fact, possibly fiction? And also, later I will break down for you the, 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 the book, divided into two, three sections. And you find that the middle section, the middle section is all written in poetry. 
written in poetry. This is really like a piece of uh, uh, artistic talent. You can write and all this kind of thing. Um, cannot be fair. I mean, you, you are just putting some flowery language to it. So David Pawson put it together and he said it is faction. Job, as we have seen, indeed was a real person. He lived in the era of Abraham. But as this was this record was put together, this, this book was put together for our edification. It was put together with uh, the word here was uh, you know like embroidery. Like you make clothes, you make the frills, make the corners and so on uh, to make it nicer. Now, right now, there is a movie called Mandela. You know Mandela? Mandela, the, the South African who passed away, the hero. So, you look at the thing, sometimes you look at movies. Uh, but Mandela lived. There was such a person. But for movies, uh, they, they just uh, put some embroidery to it, you know what I mean? So, uh, the other one that was quoted by uh, David Fawcett, Shakespeare's Henry V, he existed. He was such. You go to Buckingham Palace and so on, he was such. But they make it into a play. Was there such a person? Yes, King Henry. But of course, for stage play, they, they, they just put some frills with it, yeah, beautify it a bit. But the facts remain. The facts remain. Okay? Plus, there are many other plays that you see at the Singapore Art Centre and so on. Uh, they point to real people who have lived, but just that uh, for, for record purposes and for presentation for art, it is a bit tidy up for us. Okay? So it is. Faction, learn a new word today. Still introduction. See whether this round I can get 203 downloads. <laughs> but interesting. So that you, you, you get going. Otherwise, a joke is one book you hardly read, you never read. And then to jump in without insight. A bit challenging. So, it was described as a great work of literature. It combines epic poetry, drama, debate with uh, an intriguing plot and profound dialogue. It really takes you, or really stretches your, 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 your imagination. It takes you through all the, the constellation and the sea and, 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 the, and the mining operations and so on. The Greatest Poem of Ancient and Modern Times by this guy, I don't know him. Alfred Lord Tennyson. Doesn't matter, he also doesn't know me. Okay? But he described this as, wow, an excellent poem. He reveals a man who was very conscious of God, but who could find nothing wrong with himself. One who was very egotistical about his own righteousness, and maintain it to those around him. As you read, you, you will find, even though the, the devil, Satan said, curse, his, Satan's contention and desire is for Job to curse God, you know, and die. Curse God to his face. But Job didn't do that. So as you read his lamentation and so on and so forth, he still maintained, I have done nothing wrong. He told his friends so, I've, I've done nothing wrong. His friends kept telling him, you know why you're sick? Because you are a sinner. Because you haven't done right. Your kids haven't done right. That's why they were also eliminated. But he said, I've not done anything wrong. I have done nothing wrong. So he maintained his innocence. And sometimes, some people we talk to, or maybe we were once upon a, once upon a time like this, People share the gospel with us. He said, but I never kill, I never steal, I never destroy, I never do anything more. Why would God send me to hell? Right? So these are all the, the, the challenges that uh, we're going to study and see what we can learn from them. Now we're going to look at uh, that there is philosophy involved in this. Okay? Uh, 
Uh, again, I will not take credit for, for this. This is from David Pawson. Yeah, thanks to the book by Christina. So he, he said we can look at it from a philosophical perspective and, and it is relevant because we want to have a comprehensive study of the book instead of just jumping in and just reading through and just go out and leave the, the book. But from a philosophy standpoint, why are we here? Why are we born into this world? To live, to suffer and then die. Where did evil come from? Where did evil come from? Because I believe in a God who is good. Then where did evil come from? Why do good people suffer? You know, sometime back, there was this book written. Uh, when bad things happen to good people. Have you come across this book? By Rabbi, I don't know what. Now. Why do bad things happen to good people? But in the same breath, in the book, you see, why do good things happen to... No. Why do good things happen to bad people? First question not answered, but still got second question. Why do good things happen to bad people? Bad things happen to good people. And uh, good things happen to bad people. Why? Why? What, what is God's involvement in the world? So how is He involved? Does He care? Is He really interested in us? He is the Creator. We are His creations. But is He really interested in us? Or He is... Some people say He is too busy. He is too busy. Maybe He is attending to those who need Him more in India, in, in Afghanistan, in, in Africa and so on. But here we all... Uh, the most costliest city in, in the world. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't need... God, God will put us lower priority. Well, that is from philosophy. Then, theology. Now you know why I don't go to Bible school. Too cheap. I tell you, this drain you. And some people, some believers uh, have gone into Bible schools uh, as believers. And they come out as atheists. <laughs> they stop believing God. You know why? They get confused. They get confused. This is a, it's a constipation of the mind. <laughs> anyway, it comes out from the mouth. It's the diarrhea of the mouth. But anyway, theology. This one is good. This one, David Pawson put this together. If you believe that God is bad, then there is no problem about suffering. Am I right? That is... Is it? If you worship Satan, and some people do, I mentioned to you last week, if you worship Satan, then anything that goes wrong, what's, what's there to complain? Because Satan is evil. But if you believe your God is good, then you have a problem. But he starts off with saying, if you believe that God is bad, then there is no problem or suffering. You will just accept it because the God whom you worship is bad. But the next three points I will give you problems. If you believe that God is good, then you may have a problem. Okay. We go a bit further, we expand a bit. If you believe that God is good, but weak, and unable to do anything to help you, you have a problem. That's why I don't exactly agree with this book by that rabbi. I, I read the book, I got the book. When bad things happen to good people. A rabbi, in that book, you know what he was alluding to? That God is not all that powerful. That God can't be there all the time for you. So, that's why bad things, when they do happen to good people, well, just uh, accept it. That is not the truth. But, People struggle with this. God is good, but weak, unable to help. The last one, if you believe that God is good and able to help, oh, this is your optimism, this is your confidence and trust in your Creator. But why is He not helping me? Right? Yeah, I pray now. I really pray now. <laughs> I pray. But how come, how, how come the pain didn't go away? I don't know. Actually, uh, I think about four years ago, the night before I went for a mission trip, prayer meeting, 
I also had the same pain. So <coughs> after the prayer meeting, I went to Pastor Day. I said, Pastor, I'm going to mission tomorrow. Can you pray? That night, he prayed for me. The pain is just as bad as now. Hey, gone no. And nothing until this last week or so, and then the pain becomes a bit more. But for the last four years, uh, nothing pain went away. So this time I went to pastor, Wednesday night, the pastor came back and he prayed. Uh. Well, this time he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and prayed. Uh. Pain still there. So point number four. If you believe, I believe God is good and able to help. But why still got problem? Okay. So, like, um, Sister Quincy, we prayed for her last week, right? Mm-hmm. I visited her at the hospital, so her husband is not here today. Um, she texted me yesterday to pray because uh, suspected fourth stage lung cancer. Okay. So, but she's believing and trusting in God for, for, for healing and so on. So, just, just uh, keep her in mind. You know that old couple, you raging husband and, and the baby. Just keep her in prayer. Okay? <clears throat> so, what did the author believe? The author believes there is one God. Amen. There is one God. And that he relates to his creatures. And you will see, God did not speak. Beginning, he spoke to Satan. But then, after that, he left it, most of the book, to the three friends and Job to have their conversation. And then finally, there was another guy, Elihu. And he only come on the scene towards the last part of the book. And he made two speeches to Job. And from the two speeches, you know, he relates, he knows, he's aware. He relates to his creatures. And you will also know that he's the almighty, all-powerful creator. Omnipotent. Omniscient. Omnipresent. So I cannot agree with that rabbi. I'm not a real rabbi. But that rabbi, I cannot agree with him. He said, God is not all that powerful. The author also believes that he is good, he is caring, and compassionate. This whole lesson was to draw Job closer to God. To teach Job. And Job at the end of this whole ordeal will come up definitely to you. Ask him to stand and give testimony on Sunday at Bethesda Cathedral and tell you, my God, number one. You know what? He saw me too. He never left me. He never forsake me. He restored everything that the locusts has have stolen. Okay, so the three main sections of this book. You have the prologue, the dialogue, and the epilogue. Okay, so it's the, the appetizer, the main course, and the dessert. Chapters 1 and 2, and two, we see the dilemma of Job. He did not know what hit him. He did not know there was a, a, a wager, they call it a wager. A wager is like a bet. A bet, okay? B-E-T. He did not know that there was a bet or wager that had been placed on him. Because the devil said, you know why? You know why he, 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 he bless you? You know why he worships you? Because you know why you, you, you bless him so much? Uh, so he worship you. So God said, fine. You can take anything and everything from him, but don't touch his life. Okay, back on. And he was brought into a dilemma. Why is this happening to me? Without reason. So that was... His dilemma, chapters 1 and 2. Then in the second section, we find dialogue. So his three Panyo come, came. From far away places they came. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And 
there were three rounds of speeches. So, Eliphaz spoke three times. Bildad spoke three times. But Jophah only spoke twice. But each and every time, it didn't bring joy to Job. He got more frustrated. So he answered them. Then after that, there was silence. Silence. And then, Elihu, he was described as a young, rash, wise man. God, I got some people, young, upstart, don't know anything, but come and try and teach you how to suck it, you know what I mean? So to speak, the layman thing. So he gave four speeches and nobody answered him, not joking. So, young man, keep quiet here. Anyway, so he gave four speeches unanswered. Then God came along and gave two speeches. And by then, Job and his friends are all, but by then the friends are all out of the picture. And Job was there because God wanted to talk to him. And Job got nothing to say. Just listen. And so, the second part is the debate about Job up to 37, chapter 37. Then we come to epilogue, the finale, the deliverance for Job, chapters 38 to 42. He was delivered. But the, the epilogue, the real, real finale, we, we can find it in the last part of chapter 42. That is when you see the restoration of his family as well. But it is the dilemma of Job, the debate about Job, and the deliverance for Job. And this will be the main sections of uh, this book. Okay? So that ends the introduction.